Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard. The Inside Analog Photo radio program is all about the traditional photographic process. We talk about all aspects of analog photography, including the hybrid workflow. You can find out more information over at www.insideanalogphoto.com. And of course, Inside Analog Photo is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. These guys have the coolest instant photography materials known to mankind. They have, of course, the pack film and three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five, color and black and white. They have the Instex systems in the wide format, the Instex 210 camera and film, and of course, the Instex Mini, both in color film. Beautiful stuff. There's nothing cooler than instant photography. You get a print because if you don't have a print, you don't have a real photograph. This is great fun stuff. This is great for art. This is great for business. This is cool stuff. You definitely want to check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at DR5, DR5 Chrome, black and white, developing that turns your black and white neg into, that's right, black and white chrome. Unbelievable stuff. www.dr5.com. Our official media partner, APUG, the analog photography user group for all things traditional photographic process on the web www.apug.org and our official philanthropic partner George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film over at www.eastmanhouse.org Today on Inside Analog Photo we're going to be here with Mark Osterman. Mark is the process historian with the George Eastman House. Mark's going to join us today to talk about some updates with the George Eastman House what's going on with the educational opportunities with Mark all of his great classes and just things that are going on in general in the land of analog photography. You can find out more information about Mark over at eastmanhouse.org. Mark, how you doing today? I'm fine. How you doing? Good, buddy. Thanks for joining us here back on Inside Analog Photo to talk about some great things that are going on with the George Eastman House and all these educational opportunities that you're working on. Today, we're going to talk about aesthetics of the alternate process. Great to have you back with us. We always love having you. Oh, thanks. I always enjoy it. So one thing I want to get out to clear the air with here is there's a lot of things going on with our fine friends at 343 State Street called Eastman Kodak. We have this museum in town that called the George Eastman House that's basically named after a place where George used to live. Yeah, it's a little difficult. A lot of reporters have asked us about how we feel about Kodak and what's going on over at Kodak, but it's important to differentiate the two institutions. There's the Eastman Kodak Company, which is a film and ink company, but we're George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film. We're a completely different institution, and there's really no connection, aside from the fact that we have the house where George lived. Of course, even my father thinks I work at Kodak, so there's no correcting that with him, but we're not Kodak. We're a different place. So basically, people don't have to worry about the George Eastman House and all the work that you're doing and all the cool stuff that's going on there is safe and sound and everything's cool. Well, everything's safe and sound in the respect that all institutions are having a little hard time and museums are certainly not having it easy with the economics the way they are. But all of our workshops go. I mean, anytime we list a workshop, we do a workshop. The museum's doing fine, and we can always use contributors, but as far as the workshops are concerned, as long as we get people to come to them, we're doing fine. I'm going to put the thing out now that people should join the George Eastman House. It's really economical to support what you guys are doing for the preservation of analog photography and analog motion picture film. It's quite a unique environment, and there's some cool deals when you sign up, and I think you can really help out for like a $20 bill. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a good point because there are other museums around the world that have even taken the word photography out of the equation. So if you care about what photography was and what photography will be, we're the place that really takes care of all of that. I think it's really important. So becoming a member or giving any other gifts, of course, the museum appreciates that. And if you are a member, actually, you get to take the workshops at a discounted price. See? So signing up will save you a bunch of dough with just one (laughs) workshop. Actually, it will, yeah. I want to go into a very, I think, interesting topic, but let's tell people again what you do at the George Eastman House. Sure. I'm the process historian for the museum, and actually my wife, France, and I came back in 1995 to give workshops. 
That lasted for a few years, and then they hired me to be part of an educational program for teaching photo conservators. It was the highest level photo conservation program in the world. I think it was funded for four years, it was extended to six, and then finally extended to 10 years. During that time, I taught conservators from around the world the evolution of photography by me doing firsthand research in the rare book room. I would read the formulas, I would look at the images in the collection and the equipment in the collection, I would make images with the same process, and then compare my results under the microscope with the antique results. Essentially, what I was teaching is a connoisseurship class for conservators to understand the difference between a well-made photographic image in poor condition as opposed to a poorly made image in great condition. And there's a difference. You only know when you actually do the processes. So I had the luxury of just having all the doors open to me so that I could spend time and learn these processes. And I have areas of great depth. In other areas, not so much, but I have a good handle on pretty much the evolution of photography from about 1802 to around 1890. Well, when the program ended two years ago, in order to bridge between programs, the museum asked me to teach historic process workshops to the general public. So this is new. I started out doing that. We did it for two or three years. But for the last 10 years, I was just teaching photo conservators. And a lot of the processes that I learned teaching the conservators, many of them hadn't been revived yet. France and I really helped to revive the collodion process back in the early 90s. We taught the first public workshops in collodion, and at that time there were probably, I don't know, eight people doing collodion in the world. Well, now there are thousands of people who do collodion. And while we're not the only ones who teach, we were the first to really teach workshops. Now we have great, great grand students who are teaching collodion, and it's a very popular process. But now I've also introduced other processes that I would teach the conservators, but I didn't really see that there was any market for the general public until now. We introduced the collodion chloride printing out process last year, dry collodion albumin on glass. The first process, the heliograph of asphalt on silver plate, what Nieps invented. So we're putting some pretty esoteric processes out there, and we'll see if they stick. People are interested in these old things, and they want to make images by hand. And that's really the emphasis right now. Do you think that people want to make images by hand because they're sort of freaked out that analog materials could just vaporize and disappear? Everybody has a different reason for liking these things. And if you remember Polaroid transfers, what was the Polaroid film that you got, the negative and the print? 665 and small format and the Type 55 and all that. Yeah, that's the Type 55. They always kind of like those crappy edges that you get from pulling them apart, which really speak of a handmade object. So a lot of people who are doing the antique processes like that aesthetic. And it's understandable. I mean, it can really contribute to an image. There are people who just like the idea of making an image all their own, that it doesn't come out of a box. There are people who combine historic processes with digital. And there are people who do it as a knee-jerk reaction to digital. And of course, we're all wondering how long conventional film will last, whether it's chromogenic color or black and white media, but we don't really know how long it'll last. Frankly, I'm kind of surprised it's still around, but I think its days are numbered. Just living in Rochester, we do see wheels stop turning in certain buildings, so we don't know. We don't, and I think that, like you said, the aesthetics of some of the early processes are fabulous. One thing that I wanted to touch off on today, and I think you really want to touch off on this as well, there are people practicing historic processes, may it be 15 different kinds. And because it's a historic process, people can do subpar photography, and it's praised on the internet as like the best thing since sliced bread, when really, if you look at the photography, it's horrible. Yeah, I have to walk a nice point on the fence on this, because it's interesting. The history of photography starts out with things that are primitive and also soft. Then they go sharp. Finishes are matte. Then they go glossy. And it's cyclical. It goes up and down. The the attraction to something that looks like it's made by hand is very strong with people. And I mentioned the Polaroid lifts and transfers. When you start actually making your own chemistry or compounds and coating your own materials, it's very easy to get to the point where you make something that looks like it's handmade Maybe I should say homemade. There really is a difference between handmade and homemade. Homemade implies something that's a little rough. Handmade implies something that's made with great craft. Collodion is such a great example because it is a very elegant process when it's done very cleanly. 
and it's a very, very rough-looking process when it isn't done cleanly. You do get the good and the bad and the ugly out there. But I think one of the things that's important to point out is that every once in a while, the ugly is good. And the problem with that is when people are looking at anything that's technique-based, they might see that something that is so ugly that it actually contributes to the picture, a certain kind of veiling or fog or the thumbprints or streaks, They see that possibly as a way to make art based on process. And this is one thing I want to point out is that while if you do coax certain process artifacts to contribute to the picture, a lot of times it really kind of overpowers the picture. And then on top of it, if you don't really have anything to say, you don't really get much. Let me put it another way. If you look at the difference between, say, a David painting versus a Van Gogh painting, Van Gogh painting has lots of brush marks, and the David painting, not so much. They both have different things to say, but just doing the technique doesn't make something art. The process isn't the art. Art is the art. So no amount of making things look sloppy just contributes to it being art. If it's a dopey picture, it's still a dopey picture. Actually, what we'd like to have happen is a kind of a crusade of ours, is if we had more people doing these processes, there'd be less of a novelty. And if there's less of a novelty, you can't just go up and say, look, I made this. It's special because it's something hard, and you can see I did it with my hands. If we have more people doing the processes, we'll have more images of substance, and it's not just about the process. A lot of artists, when they talk about why they do these processes, they'll talk about the uncertainty of the process. You never know what you're going to get. Well, when you're really good at the processes, you know what you're going to get. I draw a parallel, too. If I gave my mother a table saw and a hunk of mahogany and said, make a camera, the results would be pretty uncertain. It's all based on skill, and you have to get to a point where, yes, you take advantage of serendipity, but sometimes you coax these things to happen, and you have more control over it. And then finally, you have something to say. Here's the point. Yes, you can get into some alternate processes fairly easy. And when you don't have the skill set of someone that's mastered the process, and I'm not talking about mastered the process when it comes to photographic composition. Yeah, we're not talking about the image making yet. We're just talking about the technique. Right. This is a craft, and anymore, a lot of people don't have a craft. They can do a technical operation, but it's not really crafted. I think there's a point to where you can technically mix something together and it works, but you need to learn (laughs) your craft to start with the consumer of photographic images. People that look at stuff don't know what a 1890s process should look like, never mind what it does look like. So if you can get an image to show up on a piece of anodized aluminum, then you've struck gold. But really, you've got fool's gold. And on top of it, people take pictures of a historic process and then they stick aluminum manufactured drink can in there and say, wow, look at my cool art. Yeah, it just doesn't have much depth of choice there. If you remember maybe the first time you ever developed a roll of film and made a print from it. In the old days, your first attempts at using a process or some kind of technique, you generally wouldn't go out and show it. You'd wait until you worked on your craft, you got better at it, and then eventually, and this takes a long time, you actually find out how it contributes to a voice you have about the subject you're shooting. So you wait until you have some control and also something to say before you exhibit something. With the Internet, it's a little easier to exhibit. You can have your own website. You can post things on forums. So people are putting everything they do. It's like a parent putting their child's first work in a gallery in New York City. I mean, you just wouldn't do it. It's a new phenomenon. People are excited about what they're doing. And that's good. But I have to tell you that we've had people take private tutorials in our house when France teaches the private tutorials in our studio. And they'll take the five plates that they made during that tutorial and go right to New York and say, here's my body of work. I mean, it's alarming. I guess what I'm saying is that anybody who look at that for more than five minutes is just because there's a novelty to the object. I mean, people are not used to seeing an image on glass or metal or something that's clearly hand-coded. If you think about all the platinum and gum and salt prints that have lots of overbrushing on the edges, that scream, I made this with my hands. It's kind of funny because in the 19th century, they tried very hard to show that these things weren't made by their hands, and we're going completely the opposite way around. I think a lot of that has to do with digital imaging. We want to show that we make things with our hands. Again, I'm waiting for the time when we have variety. 
when we have images that do have process artifacts that really make sense. And I'll tell you that, geez, I started teaching Collodion in the late 1980s. And when France and I met in 1990, that's when I taught her. We have had phone calls on the same day. And one person will say, I got the streak across my plate. How do I get rid of it? Within an hour, we'll get another phone call from someone who will say, last week I got the streak on my plate and I really want to have it happen again. So that gives you some idea that if you're going to play the process so that you use the artifacts to intentionally make them contribute to the picture, that's great. That's a new voice for the medium. But if it's all done by default, if it's happening without your control and you're just kind of picking out whatever happens, it's not a very easy way to make art. It's much easier if you actually know what you're going to make. So that's why we teach workshops. It's my crusade. The more people who do these workshops, the more people who know the process, the less we'll just rely on something being unique because it's a strange process and we'll really start to make some great images. Here's my question for you then. How can people make a better image no matter what they're doing, even if they're shooting on a negative or anything? Is it that people haven't succeeded in traditional photography, so they want to do an alternate or a historic process? Not everybody can play the clarinet, and not everybody can paint. And there are a lot of people that are looking for a way to make instant art. Well, remember when Jackson Pollock first got attention for his paintings, the critique was, well, anybody can throw paint. And yeah, that's true. Anybody can throw paint. Not everybody threw paint like Jackson Pollock or paint like Cezanne. If people think there's a way to make instant art, they're going to do that. But you can learn these processes to a degree where you actually have control over them. And what it takes is just not being lazy. You just have to learn the basics. You go back, and like any other art form, you get good at it. The, the first steps you take, they're not going to be so good. You'll be excited, and you should share them and say, I like what's happening here, or I don't like what's happening there, and how can I fix this? But don't expect that everything that comes out of your camera is going to be artwork. I mean, just think of how many billions of 35-millimeter frames have been taken since they invented the 35-millimeter format. Not everything's art. And yet, when a lot of these historic processes are done, the first things people make, they frame it, they enter a show, they get an award, because people are just so mesmerized by the object. They've never seen anything like that before. And there's a certain aesthetic to it that even when some things are done poorly, it's something we haven't seen before. It's something unique. All I'm asking for is some breadth of imagery. We do see kind of a lot of the same stuff over and over again. When I go on the forums, I see these kind of passport photo pictures of people straight on, angry looking out of focus, or too much in focus, but kind of the same thing over and over and over again. And everybody who makes them, for some reason, thinks it's unique and that it's something new. Chuck Close said that stuff for years, and it isn't new. Everybody's drawn to it, and I think that they should kind of do it for a little bit and then move on and see what else they can say with the process. Do you think that if you're practicing a historic process that's from 1886, do you think that you should be shooting stuff that's around 1886? No, I think that you should use it with a modern voice. You should figure out why the process works for what you want to say. I've never thought that people should just go out and take, say, reenactment photos using a process from the Civil War era. That's something you can do with it, but it's not limited to that. If you want to mix it with digital, go ahead. There are no rules in art. You can do anything you want with these processes. I'm just asking for people to realize that, like any other art form, if you did dance, if you played an instrument, if you do an applied art, if you do sculpture, you get good at it. You actually work at it, and then you actually have something to say. If I ask somebody, why did you make this daguerreotype? And they said, I don't know, it was neat. I'm sorry, it's not a good enough answer. If you're interested in making art with these things, tell me why you took the picture. And frankly, when France and I have exhibits at an opening, the last thing I want to talk about is process. I want people to ask me, why did you take that picture? And what does this picture mean? Asking somebody at an opening about their process is like asking an artist, what brand brush did you use? It's ridiculous. And I understand that when people are first starting out, doing something unusual like this is a way to get attention. I mean, I understand that. But once you get that attention, you move on. Then you really say something with the medium. And artists are really bad at talking about their work. They either talk art, speak, or they don't know what to say about it. And that's another issue. I just want people to do more of these processes. And it's going to come to the point where you can only do handmade processes, which is another way of calling alternative or historic processes, or digital or whatever comes after digital. Film just won't be here anymore. 
And this is the last holdout for light-based imagery. Assuming that a digital image in the camera is light-based, but when you print it, you're printing it with ink, no different than a printing press. That's not light-based imagery. It's an ink print. We will eventually get to the point where we have this strange combination of ancient processes and ultra-modern processes. But all the stuff that we remember from the 20th century, that stuff will be gone eventually. So you think it'll completely go away at some point here? Absolutely. I don't even know why they still make it today, to tell you the truth. It's not for old farts like us or college students. Talk to somebody who's 25 or younger and ask them what a negative is. Be a blank look on their face. And then explain to them, okay, now if you want to make a picture, you're going to take the picture and you're going to put it in a tank and develop it for 15 minutes and you got to let it wash and dry. And then you're going to go in the dark room. They'll look at you like you're nuts. They'll say, well, wait a minute, I'm just pushing a button here. Why don't I just do that? Yeah, it's the last holdout for photography are these handmade processes. There's no reason why they shouldn't continue forever as long as we get enough people interested in them. It's a counterculture. It's not everybody's cup of tea. But when I was teaching the conservators, I taught them processes as early as Niepce processes with asphalt and rock. And they thought it was interesting from a historical point of view. But a lot of them would say, well, okay, so you're teaching us this stuff. But like, when are we ever going to get our hands on a Niepce plate? It's just like a half a dozen of them out there. The Getty worked on the one out there at Austin. And I said, no, no, you don't think of it that way. The more people that get interested in these old processes you'll find some artist is going to take that process and run with it. And guess what? In the future, you're the one that's going to have to take care of it. And I feel strongly about that. You'll see many more artists taking on these processes, whether it's photomechanical, like photogravure, or they're more and more daguerreotypists now. Listen, if the daguerreotype plate was 50 cents a sheet instead of 40 bucks, everybody and their uncle would be making daguerreotypes. It's the cost of the process that keeps that one down. But you'll see more and more of these old processes coming out. This last week, I did an Oratone workshop. Actually, at Eastman House, on top of the regularly scheduled workshops, we're actually opening up to do private workshops where we actually will go to a location, host institution, or a group of artists that live in the same city. Or they'll come here, and if they want to do some kind of wacky process, even if it's one I haven't actually personally done before, I'll help them do guided research so that they can do those processes, and we'll end up with some. Making film on flexible support is the sort of thing that once the big wheels stop turning, you're not going to see it again. It's like chromogenic color. It's just not going to happen again. It's not like, and I'm not an expert at this, but I know that there are people who have been telling me that CDs are on their way out because people are now, of course, downloading all their music, that eventually there won't be CDs, but vinyl is coming back. Well, hell, I mean, to put together a press for pressing vinyl records probably costs, I don't know, $300,000 or less, and you could do it in a garage. But let me tell you, when they take apart the machinery that was used to make chromogenic color and a lot of the things that we grew up with, when that stuff is taken apart, it will never come back. Never. We're not talking about a machine that fits in your bedroom. These things are blocks long, and it's an industry. It's not a little cottage industry. So it's going to be different in the future. It is, and I think that you're right. And I've been in Building 38, and I've seen these things that are in Robert Chainbrook's book about making film. Oh, yeah. And it's not like you can code it in your garage, man. No uh, way. People have this idea that some little village in Eastern Europe is going to be making film. It's just not going to happen. Once there are fewer people to make the demand... I'm 56, and a lot of your listeners grew up with film, and they just had this idea it's going to be around forever. Well, as soon as the old guys like us are gone, and there aren't enough of the college kids that are interested in this, there's just no market. And yet, you can actually make gelatin emulsion, and eh, you can make a dry plate. Making film is a little more difficult. I also have an experimental roll film coating machine, and I have a slitter for two and a quarter and 35 millimeter. I'm trying to get the perforating machine. Eastman House actually has three of them in our equipment archive, but I'm actually not allowed to use those things. So I'm trying to get one out of Kodak before it gets tossed. The sort of thing that you would have in a research lab, not the one that would do three miles in two minutes. But there'll be a day when sometime we'll demonstrate how to do that. I've already demonstrated how to make nitrocellulose film stock for the movie people. But there's a lot of processes I taught that I don't see as particularly practical. And I haven't seen any artist jump to learn them. So just because we know historic processes, not all of them are applicable. 
several years ago, I gave a public workshop in making the first glass plate process, which was albumin on glass. So collodion is maybe like ASA-1, if anybody remembers what ASA means. Well, albumin on glass is many, many, many times less sensitive than collodion. And if you remember that ASA film speed has something to do with grain size, the albumin on glass is the highest resolution film you can possibly make ever. I mean, you can't even find the grain on a microscope if you've just been looking at, say, Tri-X or Collodion or Daguerreotype. So, like, what are you going to do with a film that takes 10 to 15 minutes in the sun for exposure? I haven't found anybody that's going to beat a path to my door to learn how to do that. But if they want to, I wrote a manual on how to do it, and every two years I gave a workshop to the conservators so they could identify it when they found it in a museum. But we don't have it on the list for 2012. We have a lot. We have a pre-photographic workshop for camera lucida and obscura and physiano trace. We have carbon, collodion paper. We have Ron Cowley teaching platinum prints. And I should preface by, you can take a great platinum printing workshop in many places. But what makes just something as common now as platinum, the preferred place to take it at Eastman House is that not only do we have Ron Cowley, who's great, but when you make a platinum print, and then the next day you get to see one made by Stieglitz, Steichen, Coburn, Case of Beer, F. Hollanday, we got the stuff. You want to see what the aesthetic of a platinum print, or when you take the albumin printing workshop, we'll bring out Julie Margaret Cameron, Gustav Le Gray. It's a different thing here at the museum. The hardest part is getting people there, and the advertising is very, very difficult. It's the most frustrating part for me. Once we get people to a workshop, the exit questionnaire we give people, they say they're the best workshops they've ever taken. You learn how to do a daguerreotype, and then we show you one made by daguerre and images made by Southworth and Hawes. The original daguerreotype cameras and equipment. The daguerreotype workshop this year is taught by Mike Robinson. So if you have people out there that are interested, you'll get the best teacher. Mike Robinson is absolutely the best. One of the presidents of the Daguerrean Society and technically probably the most proficient daguerreotypist in the world. And we have a tintype workshop coming up in March. If you want to learn how to make tintypes and see the original equipment. Actually, what people should do is just go to the website the actual address is just so long. Just search for photography workshops at George Eastman House, and you'll see all of the workshops. We actually have three in England this year, too. Three of them at Laycock Abbey, where Fox Talbot invented the negative. We have one called 1839, where you actually do the daguerreotype as Daguerre did daguerreotype in 1839. You learn the photogenic drawing process, which is what Talbot invented. And you even learn by our direct positive salt print process the picture of the drowned man, the self-portrait. So you get to see all three processes that were vying for attention in 1839 at a place where one of them was actually invented. And there's nothing more magical than that. I don't know. It's unbelievable. Goosebumpy. Well, like you said, it's the real deal, right? I mean, this is where it happened. And I think even, too, with going to and doing stuff at George Eastman House, you get to see these original photographs that you can see nowhere. Well, you make the images with guidance by people who really know what they're talking about. You actually learn the chemistry. Every workshop, we begin with a PowerPoint presentation where we talk about the history and the chemistry. You make the images, and then you see the images. And sometimes you see equipment if it's applicable. I mean, there's no albumin printing equipment. But when it comes to cameras, you actually see the Gare's camera. We've got the Gare's camera. We'll bring that out. You'll see the whole set. It's so inspiring for people. I mean, people come out of that place dazed, and we want you to come back. We'll say, hey, if you want to schedule four more days just to come in and use the library. Our research library has every book written on photography and film in at least three languages. And we don't have one 1839 daguerreotype manual. We have 15 of them. You can read each different issue. You can read them in French or English or Czechoslovakia. <laughs> it's just unbelievable the resources we have. And, of course, any museum can't show all of that stuff. I mean, if you go to the Smithsonian, you see 1% of what they own. And it's like that at Eastman House, too. You really have to make an appointment and see the stuff downstairs. We're talking two, three flights down underground. I mean, if you were to walk into the equipment vault, it's like the last scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they're pushing the box in this enormous warehouse. It's a two-story archive underground, like an airplane hangar. Just an amazing place. It is. I've been in the vault and other places there, and you don't really get the grasp of it. And we can talk about it, and you can see a couple of pictures on the website that doesn't really show very much, but until you're sort of involved in something going on there, 
it just blows you away. Yeah, it's sizable. Now, there are great collections outside the United States. The French Photographic Society has a great collection. Bradford in England, they call that now the National Museum of Media. They took the word photography out of their name, the Musée des Arts and Métiers in Paris. There are great, great collections out there. But ours is singular. Ours is an international collection. The core collection actually came from France. They like to say that it was the last boat out of France before the Germans took over France in World War II. That's the Cromer collection. It's just amazing, the stuff that's there. And If you can't learn from that stuff, your head is brick. I mean, France and I are both seriously dyslexic. Between the two of us, we make one whole normal person. But once I get into the image archive and read the texts and look at the pictures, then I go to my darkroom and replicate them. And then I bring the originals up to the conservation lab and mine, and I look at them under a microscope, and I see what I see. And you can't learn with that kind of opportunity. I've been very blessed to have a job there at Eastman House. But when people come, they really get an eyeful. We have a lot of fun, too, which is really great. There's a lot of camaraderie. People come from all over the world to take the workshops. They cost some money, of course. They're not the most expensive workshops, but they're not the cheapest. But we think that for the money, you really, really get your money's worth. I think so. I mean, really, what do these cost? Now, these are hands-on workshops. This is not where you're sitting in a hotel room at the Red Lion and somebody's yapping <laughs> at you with a PowerPoint. That's funny you say that because the Red Lion is the name of the hotel in the village of Laycock when we teach the work over there in England. They range in price from 300-something to 1,500-something, depending on how many days they are. And every time you take a workshop, you not only get a information booklet on the process, but I also include historical reading that give you the evolution of that process with facsimile copies from the original manuscripts in the collection. Every time I hand out one of those notebooks, each one of those could be published if we wanted to. You get your money's worth. Now, some people will feel that they can't afford that because of the lodging and airfare. But what? A lot of people get grants to take workshops. So that's another way of getting it. Or maybe the place where they work, they can get money. We teach a lot of teachers. If they're teachers, they'll get sabbatical money for that. Other people, they have the means. Last year, we had someone take, I think, six workshops. And we're finding that quite a bit. We'll have somebody come and take the workshop. They've had the experience of that workshop, and then they seriously look at the other workshops that we have listed. And again, we don't teach art. On the other hand, we show people what was possible with each one of these processes in the hands of someone who really, really had control over the process. And I kind of think we're doing a service that way, too, just to show people what you could make with it. It's interesting. We'll have someone who says they've made an albumin print before, and they come and take our workshop, and they realize that what they've been making was not so much like an albumin print. Something kind of foggy, didn't have rich tones. Probably they didn't have the right kind of negative. And so if you're working in isolation and you think that you're making the epitome of a process, you really have to look at examples that were done by people who really knew what they were doing to know kind of where you stand with that and also what the possibilities can be, which maybe is more important. The fact that if you think that what you made is the best that you can do with the process and then you actually see one that's in perfect condition that really illustrates what you can do with the process, that's an epiphany for people. It's not just relying on what happened in your own house. See, it just goes to show you on how much value there is on doing these things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. So where do I go? How do I find out this stuff? Where are these things located? Because I think people need to see this in print. They need to see it on the web. They need to see where they go. They got to plan these trips. In this day and age, just to get from one place to another is a big deal. Just search for Photography Workshops George Eastman House. You'll find all of the workshops described. You'll see a registration. You can click on a registration page. You can pay online. You even have some workshops where they're just lecture workshops. They're less expensive workshops. But the hands-on ones, if you really want to learn the process and see what the potential of a process can be and maybe how it can fit your artwork, not just to do a process for the process sake, but see how it can fit your own personal visions of making imagery. Just come and take a look at the listing of the workshops, and I think you'll find something that's very interesting. Like I said, the next three workshops are Daguerreotype, Tintype in March, and Ron Mallory with Gelatin Emulsion in April. Right. Where can you go learn from him? That's the only place. 
What's interesting is that Ron is a scientist, and I'm an old art student. So when we're having these workshops, even though I have a guest teacher, I'm working with them. So it's really kind of a tag team. So we kind of joke around with Ron because he is very scientific and can go on a scientific bent if led that way. And I'm the one that kind of brings him back so that the people that aren't scientists know what the hell he's talking about. Ron Mallory is brilliant. And he's a great guy. He's fun to hang out with. So, Absolutely, yeah. He's got a lot of great stories. Oh, he does. He has great stories. That's another fine opportunity there at George Eastman House. So this is great stuff. Mark, we look forward to chatting again here soon. We're going to have these continual chats here about what's going on. And I think we'll start pinpointing each individual process and we can actually talk to people about what these things are and how they can learn. Of course, there's workshops available with yourself and your wife as well with collodion work and other things. What you guys are doing is fabulous to really keep photography alive. And we all hope that there's film available for decades to come. But really, I think if you don't know about where photography has come from, then you don't know where you can go as a photographer. Hmm, good point. Really, I mean, you might be all into shooting chromogenic color film or black and white flexible support-based film, and you might see some original process where I could coat my own dry plates and look at the look I'll get, and it can completely change your outlook on photography. I will tell you that I don't see us teaching a chromogenic color 35 millimeter film process workshop anytime soon. Well, people don't understand that the films that you get from Kodak, Fuji, that make color film, I mean, these things are coated with like up to 30 or 40 layers at one time traveling as fast as a car is going down the freeway. That stuff is rocket science. Nobody's going to do that in their garage. No, we just want to make cookies. (laughs) We can teach you how to make the cookies, and they're damn good ones, too. People think of these old processes as primitive. They're only primitive when you don't know what you're doing. They can be very, very elegant processes when you really have control over them. Well, really, I don't know. I just find that all of the historic processes or whatever you want to call them these days, alternative, whatever, that there is something for somebody. Absolutely. You can take it any direction you want, and you can work them dirty if you want, and you can work them clean. And all we're saying is we want to give people the chance to actually have a choice that they can actually control the process to the point where they can use it for their own expression in their artwork. There you go. So, Mark, fabulous to have you join us back on the program today. We look forward to more cool chats about all the great stuff you're doing. I think really people need to go over to the George Eastman House website, look at what's going on, look at the workshops. While you're there, just sign up and grab a membership because you get great benefits out of it, and it does help support the main thing, too, is is the George Eastman House is a nonprofit facility that maintains the history of photography, and it's a big deal. It is a big deal, and we really appreciate you plugging us. That's great. Well, it's one of the only real causes that are worth plugging when it comes <laughs> to photography. Well, it's certainly one of them. So, Mark, again, great stuff. Fabulous to have you on the program today, and we look forward to another installment with Mark Osterman and all this fabulous work you're doing, buddy. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, there you go. Mark Osterman, process historian with the George Eastman House. Mark is an excellent educator. He does these great hands-on classes about all the historic processes. You know, he's an all-around great guy. Definitely check out the work that he's doing over at eastmanhouse.org. The Inside Analog Photo Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm for their full line of instant cameras and film. And, of course, fine quality Fuji Crystal Archive paper over at www. FujifilmUSA.com forward slash professional. Our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome at DR5.com. And of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group at APUG.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House over at EastmanHouse.org. I've been your host, Scott Shepard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. <laughs>